2022. So I'd now like to call the April 17, 2024 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Can we do a roll call? Yes, Michelle Roth. Present. Jim Metcalf. Present. Mary Lynn. Present. Charles Musgrave is not able to join us. Robert Davidson is not able to join us. And Ralph Grouswald are also not able to join us. And Kate um, is going to be joining us late around five o'clock. So um, we don't currently have a quorum, but we can move the informational items ahead in the agenda. So we have one. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Knobloch. Here. Becky Doyle. Here. Francie Jaffe. Here. Susan Bartlett. Here. Um, Heather McIntyre is here. And Councilmember Martin is not here. They're all gone. He's Okay. All right. Um, so now we have the land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the first peoples have with this land. This is our commitment to face the injustices that happened when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. Um, and we have our inclusion statement. The Sustainability Advisory Board embraces diverse perspectives from its members and the public to create an inclusive space where everyone feels welcome to share their opinions. The board asks that all attendees listen and speak with respect and avoid attacks on individuals or specific group identities. So we can come back to that one. So, um, so then we have agenda revisions. So yeah, yeah. So we are going to move up items eleven A and twelve. Yeah, eleven A, twelve A, and thirteen A, and we will move. 6A to that end. Can we do 12A without Ralphie? He sent us a write up to oh, share. Yeah. Good. Yes. If y'all want to vote on anything, we will, we'll, we can have discussion, but if we want to vote on action, we'll move that to the end. Okay. So, 11A, we'll move them to 11. I just wanted to give you all an update on the SAD composting resolution. So I've been meeting with Jim. Jim is going to present uh, under um, special presentations at next week's city council meeting. So that's Tuesday, April 23rd, yep, we're in April. Um, I did want to note that Mayor Peck uh, on the April 9th meeting did move and was approved to direct staff to work with Boulder County on um, to moving forward a regional composting facility, which is one of the primary actions that were called for in the composting resolution. So yay, that's great <laughs> and exciting. Um, so, it, like, so this county's own composting rather than the A1? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the county has been in conversation about that for a while. Um, Charlie and Nicole will talk to you about that a little bit at the last meeting. Um, so the, the council did take action specifically to direct staff to work with the county um, on moving that forward. So that's a, that's a great action item that preempts our composting resolution a little bit, but um, just wanted to let y'all know that that is moving forward next Tuesday. If anyone else would like to come and show their support, that would be great. Jim and I will be there. Um, Jim, do you want to add? Anything? Yeah, well, you know, I watched the the, the video of the meeting yes. and I was like, yeah, well, well, I guess that's kind of exactly what we're hoping to have. Right. Anyways, exactly. So I'm not I'm not totally sure that what I thought of saying is, you know, I think it'd be good to notify people. Yeah. But um, but I mean, it's great that it's moving forward. I think. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Um, I haven't heard anything about a timeline, a specific timeline. I don't know if you've heard anything about staff bringing that forward. That would be mostly focused on the Charlie and on the sanitation side of things, but I'll keep you all kind of in the loop on that. I know the county is doing stakeholder engagement, and we shared those surveys with you all. If you all are interested in participating in that, and I'll continue to share other opportunities with them. Yeah. And Jenny and I can help you. Yeah. So 12A, so Ralph attended, um, and also Mary Lynn, so um, please feel free to share your thoughts as well. The Westminster Board of Environmental Affairs, kind of regional environmental affairs sustainability uh, meeting that happened in March, uh, the same day as our last meeting. Uh, and Ralph was not able to be here with us, but sent me this right up to read to you all, and then um, feel free to ask any questions. We can have some discussion, and then if folks, um, I want to get your feedback as well, Mary Lynn, and then we can discuss um, kind of best ways to move forward. So on March 20th, Mary Lynn and Ralph Groswell attended in person the meeting coordinated by the Sustainability Board of Westminster. There are about 30 people in attendance. Um, from Front Range communities, including both staff and volunteer board members. A group of five to eight people sat at different tables and shared information about what their community was doing. And at each table, one representative took notes. Uh, Ralph presented the priorities of Longmont. Then each table representative presented an overview of what was discussed at the table. Since this was the format, Ralph did not get to hear much about what other communities were doing other than those directly at the table that he sat which included Inglewood, Erie, and Westminster. Um, Mary may have a different perspective based on the experience with her group, um, but below were Ralph's impressions of the event. So first, this is a confederation of different communities at different levels of sophistication regarding approaches to sustainability and environmental challenges. As such, there is not a central mechanism of coordination at this time, and there was not a suggested plan on going forward as to how we might coordinate interests and efforts. In subsequent meetings, this will take shape, but right now, and considering the varying interests, Ralph isn't sure on how productive the initiative will be. Longmont is very sophisticated in its approach to these issues, whereas some of the communities represented at his table were still trying to get their city to adapt to centralized trash pickup. In addition, Ralph heard but didn't get the details that, a governmental, that at a governmental staff level, there is some kind of coordinating group that interfaces with other communities in our area. I can share more information on that. It would help to know more about that. In our last two meetings, I asked for any priorities our board may want to collaborate on with other communities, and the general consensus was to see what others were working on and then decide our level of interest in any particular issue. So in conclusion, while any coordination can be beneficial, Ralph isn't sure at this point that the initiative is the best vehicle to further the goals of our community. Um, Mary may have additional comments or ideas, and is happy to continue to attend the Westminster meetings if the board would like representation. Mary, if you want to share your yes. So, um, Longmont and Boulder were both um, in attendance, um, and uh, we're Boulder County is very much um, ahead of where the rest of the state, or at least the Front Range, sort of seems to be. Um, in a lot of initiatives, and at, I, I sat at a table also that was staff members from, I believe it was Westminster, Colorado, and no, Westminster, Bloomfield, and I think Bowie. And they were all also working on universal hauler, is the way that they put it, doing mm -hmm. centralized trash pickup and trying to deal with the fact that there's multiple providers and organizing that. and. Um, they were looking at uh, um, including recycling with that, and um, they, my impression, and they were all staff members, and my impression was that uh, most of the cities uh, on the front range, at least in this group, um, 
have staff that are handling the things that this board does, and they're understaffed, and they they don't even have recycling in a lot of the cities. So I did speak to the folks from Boulder um, who are very interested in soil, and very interested in um, um, new, updated, more sophisticated, and more appropriate approaches to measuring sustainability. They said that they believe that it's soil and it's water retention in soil and that we should scrap carbon because it's, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because we need carbon and since soil is an important is, is the most important carbon sink that we have any um, contact with, not being, being a landlocked state, not being near large bodies of, of water, like the ocean, um, water retention in the soil means that there, there's carbon being retained in the soil and the soil is healthy and just um, the soil is acting as a carbon sink. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, my husband Ben came down with me and he's a farmer and he was invited to just stay and they loved having been there and they loved being on top of the farmer. So if there's still any recruitment going on for people to be on this board, I think it would be really worthwhile to have uh, somebody here who is working with soil. Um, and uh, I think it would be very useful to continue to go to these quarterly meetings simply to sort of set the benchmark. Ralph was, I think, okay, I'm, I'm going to opine. Ralph suggested that we come up with our punch list of most important um, projects and that we uh, could strategize on them together and I think that these overworked staff who are trying to get universal calling and simplifying kind of gave him the deer in the headlights look. So, you know, Ralph's an entrepreneur and he likes to get things going in this kind of gun call. And I was looking at it and thinking, well, it'd be worth it to continue to attend and um, share information and sort of like help, um, just help to just build the community of information was the most important thing to me. So not necessarily for our benefit so much as for the benefit of the other mm -hmm. cities involved. So okay. that's my update. Thanks, Mary. I we appreciate like that. Um, Council Member Martin, just to catch you up, we do not have a quorum. So we are moving some things around on the agenda to push informational items up until um, Kate comes at around five so that we have a quorum so that we can do voting items and try to push our presentations a little bit later. So Thank you. I said, well, that's the end of getting stuck in the drive through <laughs> No problem. Sorry to catch you up, wondering why we're at the end of our meeting already. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to, while we're interrupted anyway, I'd like to ask Mary for a clarification when you say not think about carbon. Are you talking about not um, trying to have the city reduce its carbon emissions from other sources? Or, or what exactly did you mean by not think about carbon? So, I I believe, uh, and first off, I, th I think we should ask Jonathan Cohen to come talk to us. He's the Chief Sustainability Resource Officer for the City of Boulder, and he's the one who brought up this idea, and I've been reading about it, and I'd like to learn more about how Boulder is using this idea. Um, but what is the idea? It, it's the idea that measures of sustainability are transferred to using um, water retention in the soil versus carbon capture and um, carbon um, other methods of, you know, as a primary uh, measure of our sustainability. So I would like to learn more from him and see how the city is actually making that applicable. Uh, the more I learn about electrification, and it seems to me that electrification causes more fracking because um, utilities everywhere are building more gas plants to be able to meet the demands of the, of the, uh, of the grid. I think we need to start looking at other ways to understand um, our respons responsibility in terms of stewardship with the soil and looking at other ways to manage our electric demand and electric grid. So I was in a, a meeting, we are participating in a Boulder County nature-based climate solutions group. Great. And Brett Concaren from the city of Boulder was at the meeting on Monday 
speaking to what you are talking about. And it's not like they are pursuing electrification and all the other mitigation measures that we are also pursuing. They are talking about what Brett talks about, and I haven't had a chance to follow up with him, is when we're talking about nature-based climate solutions from his research and the work that they are doing, that it appears to be a more effective metric to look at soil and soil health and water retention versus carbon sequestration opportunities because there's a lot of variability in that based on the research they've been doing over the last couple of years in terms of trying to understand this carbon sequestration potential mm -hmm. and kind of the end of the day is we need to keep as much of it in the trees and plants and soil as we can, mm -hmm. but that the soil health, the water retention is a better metric in terms of soil health is my understanding of that. So it's not necessarily scrap carbon entirely as an understanding for how we're doing climate action, but when we're looking at the nature-based climate solution pieces, that that's probably a better understanding of the health overall and its benefits to our ecosystems. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so not talking, not um, moving away from electrification, but moving away from measuring emissions like tailpipe and gas stoves and. and not even that, um, but when looking specifically at the opportunity, and, and again, this is just my understanding based on this brief meeting we had the other day. So mm -hmm. I would love to talk to Brett more about that to see what the city of Polar is doing on that front. But it's looking at the when they've really been pushing that in addition to all of the technological pieces and the mitigation pieces and this would be a mitigation component as well but looking valuing more strongly the nature of based climate solutions and the benefit and value that comes from that but the way that we've been talking about that in some spheres to this point is around carbon sequestration and he's kind of flipping back to say the more effective measure is looking at soil health Probably more economically feasible than carbon sequestration, at least for a long time. That's right. And he, tree planting is another big one that folks are looking at along the current range. Yeah, that's part of that that whole the nature-based climate solution. I so I have to make about that in my report. There are a number of folks. In fact, there's even a there's even a um, office of like tree planting. I remember what it's called. Um, and I believe Lafayette or Louisville. I believe it's Lafayette. So. Yes, so this, this approach is sort of catching on. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, we had, was it a couple of years ago for Boulder Boulder Dam? We gave them a presentation. Was that pre it was right COVID? before COVID. Yeah. Yep. And it was Brett Kingsbury. Okay. Yeah, it was Brett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, like, one of the, I think a lot of us are rightfully suspicious of carbon sequestration. It yeah. seems like it's a way for a lot of large companies to say they're going to do something without actually doing anything. Like that. Yeah technology is not there. But I also think that some of the, the ideas of sequestering significant amounts of carbon through, especially in the high plains tree planting, are not also backed up by a lot of, by a lot of data. And restoring short grass prairies and all those other things are certainly there, but they, um, yeah. I, I would be interested to hear what they have to say now, because I thought when they, when Boulder presented here last time, my view of it was, how can I felt that a lot of their strategies are how can we say that we're doing things without actually changing some of the fundamental problems that Boulder has about sustainability? You know, it's unbelievably expensive, and everybody has to commute everywhere. And, and they said, well, if we can just keep our open space, then, then that's what we're going to do. So I'd be interested to hear what they're. What, what they've evolved on now. But, so is he from Boulder County? Yes, Jonathan, Boulder. Jonathan Cohn is with the C Chief Sustainability and Resilience Office yeah. with the City of Boulder and yeah. is also a lecturer at the university. Yeah. We also talked a lot about farms and I, I picked up this crazy idea that I called Greater Bug because Denver has Doug, Denver Urban Gardens, and I wanted something that had bug in it. And I thought, what if we collaborated across Boulder County to create an urban garden program and he thought that was a great idea so i think that there is an opportunity for collaboration right there and i mean i'm always using you know start at home my own example we live in a quarter acre lot that um, is just like it's wall-to-wall -wall food growing um you know and mostly perennials trees and so forth and i would love to see us really 
focusing on using the soil that we have, you know, with the greatest impact that we can everywhere that we can. And because my background in, in communications, I really think that that's the best way to sort of like get people passionate yeah. about the soil and sequestration and, and trees and fruit yeah. trees and whatever it is to have projects like that going. So, yeah, um, I actually really like the cross county garden idea. Yeah. Um, because and this is a suspicion, you know, based on stuff that I have working on land use and what the commissioners are, how they're treating their open space and stuff. You know, uh, I'm really proud of the way the Longmont Mass manages its open space, which is mostly owned. Um, and uh, Boulder County, a lot of their open space is just easements that prevent development, but I, I feel without substantiation, so I could be talking out the wrong end here, but that they are not as rigorous as they ought to be in terms of making sure that that open space is managed and used properly. I have so much to say about that if you want to hear my one minute. If you believe me, I'm, that, that's oh, enough yeah. for now. But this, this idea would be a way to get everybody involved in seeing that that's they right. do manage it. Right. And we'll, look, a couple of things. I'd be happy to invite somebody from the city of Boulder, Brent, and or Jonathan. Brett is the one yes. that leads that and it is steeped in all of the research and I, and he was the one who came so if I gave it time to follow up because we never ended up doing with anything with that because yeah. everything else got turned upside down. Yeah. Um, there are some research studies I see that Francie's pulled up some reports that we can share with you in the meantime that I think speak to some of the findings that Brett was sharing at this meeting um, the other day. I do want to keep us on track for today because we have two presenters. Kate, just for your information, we had to bump some things around on the agenda until we had a card, so I'm excited that you're now here. Yeah. Hey. Um, so my understanding though, one, there was also Growing Gardens, which is the countywide urban gardening initiative. Um, I can't speak too much more to them, but, but it's not something that at some point um, there's interest in pursuing. Oh, I was, we did a staff tour of growing gardens in Longmont, and we seem happy to do that, so that could be an opportunity. Um, yeah, and that's my background. I worked for Denver Urban Gardens for a long time, so I think it shows me a lot um, as well. I think with regards to the Westminster meeting, it sounds like Mary, if I'm understanding correctly, they're just going to have quarterly meetings yeah. moving forward, so we can continue to participate in that and as opportunities arise, we can discuss them further. I think we'll probably make a vote on that. Um, and then there is a both a regional quarterly sustainability group that is staffed across the front range. We get together quarterly, we share information, we talk about different projects. We always look for opportunities for collaboration. And then there's also a Boulder County group similarly. Um, so I stay in pretty good contact with a lot of folks in the county and along the front range. Well, because um, we were we we had the last meeting. Um, actually, I'm not sure when our next meeting will be. I'm wondering if we could miss that. No, that last one was just in March. So, mm -hmm. so our next one will be probably June. Okay, or May. I'm not sure. Anyway, I was just thinking that if you're already having the staff meeting, Lisa, it was staff people. A lot of the that that meeting was staff people. Should we just uh, combine them? Um. But Potentially, um, that would be a decision for the broader front range group yeah. as well, so that I'm happy to check in with folks. Yeah. Our next meeting actually, I think, might be this year. Do you all want to vote on continuing to at least participate in the quarterly meetings? Well, I kind of, we, we already voted to do it last time. Do we have to change that status? I don't think we do. I guess so. I mean, I'm well. I'm happy I don't. Have, I don't have any objections to, to. We just um, we'll just um, force a review on the committee that you as person to. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, all this all the longest. So that would have to be Nathan. <laughs> okay. So with that, I want to go ahead and jump back. If it's okay, should we just do the thirteen e quick and then go back? Since we already moved that one down. Oh sure. Um, Councilmember Martin, we, I just put on here the code 
of ethics that was shared. I wasn't sure if there was any more context or anything that you wanted to share with this group. Hopefully you all saw the email that went with that, but. Yes, uh, Ralph, it's a pity he's not here, um, but uh, he asked uh, whether the changes would um, made members of this board liable if somebody objected to some to a city policy. And he ha is putting together a long research statement in answer to that question. But his off the cuff answer, which is all I have at this point, is that there's nothing in there that could make any of you any more liable than you already are. <laughs> which was, you know, kind of a Eugene sort of an answer. But, um, you know, my, my I'm not a lawyer answer is that the city council or the city manager or the chief of public safety are the authors of actions that, that, that could potentially you know, make somebody um, say they've been harmed. And the, I doubt if Mr. May will find that this board or any advisory board is powerful enough um, to be liable in any significant way. But that was the under the I'm not a lawyer disclaimer. Just so I'll let you know, Eugene May is the city attorney. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Chair Roth, I will turn it back over to you. I'm sorry for the jumping around. So we'll get back to number six. Okay, so approval of minutes from our last meeting, which is March 20th. Um, does anyone have any changes or corrections that need to be amended? Do you want to count? Because uh, I wasn't there. Am I right? That yeah, I, I same. Yeah, both of you. Can, we can still vote. Board members, you only still so if we trust these two, then it's okay. Well, if you watch the video. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. Yeah. 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 I just read the minutes and listened. Um, so it's in like the motion. Yes. Seconded. Yes. All those favor. Thank you. Um, all right. So then we'll go to number eight. Yep. So um, first we have transportation mobility plan. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm Phil Greenwald, I'm the Transportation Planning Manager with the city. And I always preface that by saying I manage the longer range pieces of transportation. So if you have problems with that traffic light that doesn't turn green quick enough, I can pass those on to people who know it better than I. But I do more of the long range piece of this, and that's why we're really talking about the Transportation Mobility Plan tonight. And um, more of that long range help. But you'll see some stuff is coming up pretty quick, so we'll talk about that as well. Yes. Oh, sure. Go on over here. How wonderful it is to see something happen quick. It's going to be fun. Yeah. It's going to be too quick. Don't watch. I don't care. <laughs> we'll work it out. So the mobility plan is really about <clears throat> more of that idea of a, you know, let's start planning in five to ten to fifteen year, twenty year increments. We are doing a lot of things that we can talk about later, um, and we're we'll happy to come back and talk more about the projects. We're going to impact you in the next one to five years. But this is really about talking about further out, uh, looking further out. And tonight we just want to talk about the kind of the project overview for the transportation mobility plan. TMP is what we're calling it. So that's uh, that's kind of the standard across the across all the different jurisdictions. So that's been nice to just have people reference it back. It's kind of a comprehensive plan for transportation. We also want to talk about community outreach and existing conditions and the next steps. So hopefully you can bear with some of that and we'll have plenty of time for questions, I hope. Um, so a little project background. Uh, we talk about the transportation mobility plan as far as what's its history. And a lot of it is talking about the idea that we've been actually planning transportation since 1871, right? I mean, the people who put this city together did a great job, I think. And maybe there's lots of debate about that, but they did a great job of putting the streets together, uh, building that grid system, that original mile piece. We built onto it, the people who came after it built onto that. 
there may not have been a specific transportation plan with that. And so that didn't really happen until 2005 when we started talking about multimodal um, and how things integrated with land uses. So that first plan in 2005 is really the first foray into that. And so um, I got to be here to do that as well. So I've been here for 24 years. So just to give you a little history of where I'm coming from from this. Our most recent plan was the 2016 Envision Longmont plan. We incorporated the land uses for Envision Longmont, which is a comprehensive plan for the city, with the transportation pieces. So I was really trying to put those things together and look at it more systemic than just transportation over here and land uses over here. I mean, we look at parking, we look at streets, those are land uses. So I mean, we need to start thinking about how these all work together. Um, we have had a lot of changes and there's been a lot of discussion. You'll hear some, some of the new things that we're talking about are like micro transit, which we hope to get off the ground in July. Which is yes, soon. The quick. That's kind of pretty soon. Yes, right? that's what I thought you were going to so, uh, so, so those kind of things weren't even a thought in 2016. Well, they were a thought by somebody, but not, not more, here. <laughs> no, not more globally. So, it's been good to kind of bring those new elements into this transportation planning process. So new ideas, new things coming along, so it's been exciting. And then we really need to set a roadmap for transportation based on, based on what we have for available and potential resources. So we really want to line it out so anybody from the public can come out and start to see what projects are going to be in my neighborhood in the next five, 10 years. Might not, you know, maybe 15, maybe 20 as well, but that five-year kind of capital improvement program is what we're really trying to go try to build to, and so we want to make sure it's very clear where these projects will happen and what they're meant to be. So hopefully that will be the end product when we get to the end of this process. So you'll see we've done some public engagement pieces um, on the top. Uh, you'll see more about that. I really want to get into that and talk about what the public has told us so far in this. So phase one <clears throat> was the winter and the spring. Capturing the feedback on the community's experiences and just getting that idea of like where we can do better or where there's deficiencies that people are, are identifying. And we've putting together that feedback on the draft recommendations. So that'll all go into the how we prioritize projects. We want to start to build, build some criteria based on the feedback we're getting from the public and kind of plug in projects with the criteria so that we can evaluate the projects and see where they move up and down on the list. A big key piece of this, which we'll mention later, but is really the equity piece of this, so that we're putting the resources where they are needed, rather than just putting resources, you know, into projects that are popular or, you know, are on the on the cusp of a lot of people talking about or things like that. We need to put them in places where maybe, um, you know, we heard loud and clear from our ECAT team, which was great to go to, was the idea that there's some places in east on the east side of town. Uh, Martin and Knight was brought up specifically as a place where you know, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but there's a lot of people trying to cross Knight and Martin. So what can we do? You know, obviously they, the, the, the need to direction is put, let's put a signal there. Let's see how this goes through and we'll see if that's if that makes sense or not. Maybe it's a maybe it's a better crossing treatment just for pedestrians that we don't have to stop the pedestrian and stop, you know, we can have the pedestrians just go through without having to stop, we can put something like a few flashing signals there and just stop traffic there. Anyway, um, I get too excited about this. So <laughs> give me the boring eye look or whatever, because I'm a, I, I, I love talking about this. But uh, um, the project, um, existing state of transportation in Longmont, vision and goals, um, we're, we're putting that together now. As we speak. And then the draft recommendations for walking, biking, driving, the prioritized list of capital improvement projects, all the things I just talked about, they're going to be coming up in the summer. So we're looking to wrap this up and take it to council in the fall, or, or it will be the fall. <laughs> it won't be later. Though. We want to do. We want to be quick. It says winter, but we're going to be quick. Yeah. So I, I there is a word I don't see here, which is community education, because, uh, you know, you uh, I get a lot of letters complaining about bicycles riding in the street. Like they assume that because there's a lane for bicycles in some places, that somehow bikes aren't allowed to be in the street because streets are for cars. And that of course is wrong. But 
there's only two things we can do about that. You know, we can complete the bike, net, bike network so you never have to complete yeah, the yeah. bike network. Or you which can is make, almost impossible. Which is almost <laughs> impossible, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can put people back into I think you're going out my driveway, right? How do I... Right, a, 19, yeah, a 1968 <laughs> mindset where a bike is a vehicle and you better treat them that way. Right. You know, and because people seem to have forgotten that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point of the whole thing is to start setting up that education. And the other piece that we're not going to talk about directly tonight, but it's going to be kind of the background piece of all of this, is the council has adopted Vision Zero. So the idea that zero deaths are, are the only accepted number that we can have of, of people dying on our roadways or walkways or whatever, any, any kind of travel mode, we, we don't accept any deaths. So. Part of that's going to be that's a huge education component. We're going to share a lot of that with Vision Zero. So, so the outreach phase in February, um, we did do a lot of work to do an open house. You'll see that uh, I won't go through all of this because I know it's, it's it's pretty long. We've got great people coming up next to talk to you as well. So I want to make sure that we uh, get get through this. But I won't read all of this. But just to say that we have had a thousand engagement touch points so far. A lot of that has been in survey responses. So through our website, we had uh, 297 people put dots on a map to tell us where they thought there were some deficiencies, or maybe where there's some good things too. So we got a little of both, but most of it was deficiencies. Uh, so um, we did have 55 people attend our open house, which was pretty good, pretty full room. Uh, it was pretty exciting. But obviously, it was that open house kind of led us to this survey response and, and opening up to the web and getting that information out, which I think is where people really talk to us. And you'll see some other ones too. We had a bike to work day, a winter bike to work day event where you know, we had 30 people show up. That was pretty exciting on, not a great day, but it was a good day. So it was, it was nice. Um, so uh, this just kind of reiterates a lot of that information that we were reaching out to the general public. We did the social media piece. We've got a lot of stuff on Engage Long Month. So, if you do get a chance, go to the Engage Lama website. We're the first thing on the, on the list there, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, we've talked to a number of groups. Uh, we still need to do a better job with our Center for People with Disabilities. Unfortunately, that day we were going to meet with them, and why it's still on this list was the same day that uh, Representative Reduce came and gave us a giant check for a million dollars for micro transits. So that's exciting. Yeah, we <laughs> scheduled this CPD. Yeah. yeah, but that was unfortunate. We've got the ECAD I mentioned that earlier, so thanks all, all the folks to my right who helped us do that. So thank you. And the bike to work piece. Can I just say the back for this? Uh, I think all the climate action. Oh, I thought it was yours. I, I just <laughs> think it's the same Yeah, yeah so thanks. Like sorry. Sorry about that. Afterwards. This is not a great picture, but a good picture of showing all the different touch points that we got from folks. Some of those 297, 297 dots that we'll put on the map. This kind of gives you an idea of kind of spatially where those comments were from around the city. So um, we were probably a little deficient out here, it looks like, or maybe everything's really great out here. So we'll, we'll kind of figure that out. But you can see where the bulk of things are in the downtown. Uh, we did get some surprising pieces up in the Northeast here. And then uh, a lot of folks came out about the 17th and Hover intersection east there. We just Recently had a um, pretty, pretty bad crash out there that was, I want to say almost self-induced, but. Um, Is that around 66 up there? No. 66, yeah, would be right yeah. up here. Yeah, you're right. That's so this is, yes, that's going to be the airport, right? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me? The, the big, big one on the big red flash airport. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. did I say over? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's I'm sorry. Nice. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's been some pretty big concerns out there with uh, Westview Middle School and those kind of things out there. So it, it makes sense. A lot of stuff at uh, 119 and Hover down here too. We're going to be spending a lot of money on that intersection in the next two years uh, to uh, with with the CDOT help to improve that too. So there's a lot of a lot of fun things going on. I'm not gonna... If I could just put one in, put put one thing. Uh the previous slide that the, those pale Oops. spots out at 119 and County Line Road um, there yeah the 
there's a lot of people who are, are unhoused or staying in the extended stays that are out there and stuff, and they couldn't come in for the Charette because they, you can't get there from right. here from there. Right. So I would, you know, maybe deepen those dots just based yeah. on anecdotal evidence. Of, yeah. Well, another reason why we went out to the web, you know, the down, Sorry, the downtown blog, um, what's the northern um, terminus of that? What's that street? I'd say it's about 11th Avenue, okay. probably right here is 11th. And then it goes down to about 3rd, or is that around 1st? It goes down to about 1st, yeah. yeah. And then Martin's right here, or uh, Boston's right here, so yeah, it's pretty close to 1st. And is that parallel road pike? There's um, pike down here, yeah. Oh, the, the, I'm sorry, the... Um, this right. one's Kim Pratt yeah, Boulevard. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so you can imagine a lot of comments about congestion yeah. in here, so. One interesting thing is that congestion really does help with crashes. It reduces crashes. So mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, issues with 66. trying to balance all these different things. 66 as well, right? Well, because people go so fast, there's no congestion up there yet. Yeah, um, you do get, you'll, 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 you'll be amazed how many people call about how terrible it is to drive on that road because it's so congested. Really? That's so, not great. That means it's you just to see another car. Right. <laughs> right. Um, our respondents to the to the surveys, uh, as you can imagine, skew a little bit uh, because of just how you know how we've done it, basically with computers. You know, it's been computer based, so you have to have access to a computer and to the internet, and so um, we do get some of these people who I mean are. Highest number of respondents earned over $150,000 per household. Um, the 35 to 44 group was the biggest number from, from the, the age group, and that white obviously was the um, most dominant folk or group that uh, responded to our survey too. So we're doing more of that outreach now where we're getting out to different groups because we've seen kind of what we've done as a cross section, and we're trying to pair that and, and tie it more into. Uh, our makeup as a city to better understand that. Uh, you can probably imagine that a lot of folks, uh, I mean, I think this is going to be the thing where you go, yep, yep, yep. Um, most people drive alone with or with family members, 77%, bicycling, 14%. We have a pretty, pretty good bicycling community, I mean, but this is pretty, pretty low. And so just I'll, I'll let you look at the other things as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges associated with walking or using a wheelchair in Longmore, um, non-existent or insufficient sidewalks is the number one answer there. Um, there are locations with non-existent or insufficient crossings. Streets are uncomfortable or unsafe to walk and wheel along. So I'll do the, kind of the top three of these, but uh, travel distances are too long was also a number, you know, pretty close to number four there. Biggest challenges associated with bicycling or scootering in Longmore. Streets are unsafe, uncomfortable. Trails do not go where I want them to go. I cannot safely get to the multi-use trails. And then insufficient or poorly marked bike lanes is also pretty high up on the list too. I think we can all agree to a lot of these things. So I think, I think our community, when I ask people, you know, do you generally agree with this? I think everybody has their head nodding pretty well through this. Biggest challenges associated with taking transit in Longmont, you can guess this one too. The bus doesn't go where I want it to go. The bus doesn't come frequently enough. The bus doesn't run early or late enough. Um, so there was also some safety concerns there, uh, so we got to be cognizant of that. The biggest challenges associated with driving in Longmont, too much traffic, which is interesting. Uh, there are no challenges with driving in Longmont was the second answer. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and other, we need to delve into other. Honestly. Yeah, that's a big chunk. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what, what that is. But, uh, in your opinion, what are the most important factors the city should consider when prioritizing transportation projects and spending? Improving biking by filling gaps between existing dedicated bike facilities is number one answer, and then provide a balanced transportation system that provides connectivity and comfortable options for all modes. Uh, yes. Improve traffic flows and reduce traffic congestion, which is interesting because we just talked about those challenges. Uh, improve biking by adding more dedicated bike facilities. So, Interesting. These are the key themes, so I probably should just skip right to this one because this is really the one where speeding is an issue. 
they'd like to see more enforcement. Most people would like to see more enforcement. We hear that all the time, I think, too. Support and desire to be inclusive of all modes of transportation, so really giving that choice to people so they can choose different modes of transportation. <laughs> um, yeah, as they make sense, because right now it seems like one mode would make sense and not others. Correct. Again, the sand, the sand, the sand, the sand <laughs> transit options are, in, are inadequate. This is true. We're hoping that microtransit helps fill some of those gaps for the city because what it's really meant to do is where there's not good transit, get you a chance to get those first and final mile connections. Now, can you just talk briefly about what microtransit is? I'm not sure that everybody has Yeah, shoot, yeah, I do know. Just briefly. So basically, microtransit is the idea of kind of placing an Uber or Lyft type system that would have kind of one cost, like one or two dollars per trip instead of doing it by, instead of scaling it by demand, it would just be uh, a fixed cost on that. And so you can call in, you can use your phone to, to, to hail a ride. If you use a phone, Basically, any language that you speak will be translated into the, the request. So we all have we have that capability with the city as well. We have a broad language base piece where we can think almost any think and call it almost any language. So within 15 minutes of doing that ride healing piece, one of these vans, and I should have brought a picture, but it's basically a six to eight passenger van that's branded with the city. Logo will get will get a great name. We'll go out to the public and try to figure out you know, some great names um, for this service. But uh, within 15 minutes, this uh, up this van will come within a couple blocks of your house, and so you may be asked to like meet it out with some other people, and you may have to share a ride. And then within 15 minutes of being picked up you would be taken you may have to drop off people at different places too it's like a, almost like a car share car pool type piece but within 15 minutes you reach your destination so and they may not be able to take you all the way across the city but they may be able to connect you with existing transit services they're not going to be able to take you anywhere in the whole region and take you within the city of Longmont so uh, we're looking to expand that because we're getting a great new mobility hub at 119 and 925 in a couple months, uh, CDOT's putting that together or building it. And uh, once that's complete, we'd like to get people out there because there's a great bus service directly to Denver and directly to Fort Collins on that. So that would be wonderful to get out there. Thanks. Sure. Lack of safe bicycle facilities. Um, I'm not sure about the scrolling cost. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm going to have to talk with my consultants about that. <laughs> I feel like they're happy about it. So there's a lack of connectivity in the bike network, so you hear a lot of bicycle themes here, but you want to be able to bicycle better across the town. Uh, this is kind of interesting. I, these are regional travel, travel patterns based on um, connected vehicle technology. So when your car has a built-in navigation system, you're giving information to the world. <laughs> well, in case you didn't know. Yeah, in case you didn't know. We used to use the phones, which I thought was a lot more interesting because you get walking data, bicycling data, car data, bus data kind of things because you can tell when a bunch of phones were the same unit kind of moving at the same speed in a, maybe a bus. But uh, Have you seen that guy who um, uses his phone GPS to uh, drive dinosaurs um, with his bike? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. On Strava or something like that? Or is it? Yeah. So we found out that a lot of folks uh, go in between or come from uh, from Boulder or the Boulder 119 corridor. So great that we're going to build bus rapid transit in the next two or three years along that corridor. And certainly I can come back and chat more about that if you want. A lot of folks coming from North Weld County, which was interesting, and from South Weld County, and then Larimer County. So that's, that's a lot of the folks that are doing regional travel into our town. And when they show up in town, they Primarily go to the southwest part of town for those regional trips and even to the north part of town, which is interesting. And we found that a lot of a lot of folks are we thought the downtown would be more of a destination for regional trips, but I think what this might be looking at is more commuter times. And so this is work trips more likely. So is it going to pretty much for our tech quarter? Yeah. Our little yeah, I think so. Silicon Alley, whatever it would be called. Yeah, that's a great, great name. <laughs> 
there's some interesting information too that 70 percent of the trips that start in walmart also end in walmart so we've got a lot of internal trip making being done and when you see kind of what happens here here's kind of where we're traveling a lot of internal southwest to southwest uh, internal trips a lot of southeast southwest trips uh, you can kind of see what's going on there here's the biggest number though that i think is really telling of walmart it's almost 80 percent of the trips in Montmartre are between one and five miles long <laughs> so if we could get people on bikes if that was more comfortable if we could get people into this micro transit which i think is going to be very comfortable and, and convenient and safe those could really start to take over a lot of those trips walking trips um, and you know, other other pieces like that but i think the bike this really points to the bicycling piece 11 percent of the trips are less than one mile so clearly walking trips that can be made there and there are no trips downtown that's why i always wonder about this this seems to just show people rotating around the downtown and i'm like <laughs> but not going make, to the downtown? that doesn't make sense to me but uh, um, i've had a lot of questions to our consultants about the reliability of this data and how we can get better more put some more layers on top of this this is called, called this is from street Lights data which is they've had they've been forced to move away from the phone based piece and go to this connected vehicle which is more open source data so more open data yeah i'm doing the same thing becky so yeah. um, how much of this is deliveries uh that's a great question i i don't know um, you know like amazon pizza drop top i think they're trying to stay away from that component and go more to private vehicles and not commercial vehicles with this data. The grub would still show. Yeah, important. Yeah, grub yeah. would still the soft show. Yeah, I think it's really important information. Yeah, what I did today was, I'll be honest with you, is I gave my consult. I, I couldn't pay my consultants to come to every advisory board for the city, so I'm kind of in their place. So I apologize for not having all the info that um, behind this data, but we'll get it for you. We can get that, that and clean up. Yep. So the roadway network, I think you pretty much realize this, but it's kind of good to see is the different speed limits that we have, and the different types of collectors, arterials, um, and different, like, different, our roadway network, basically, and how it's operating, or how it's operating today. One of the big components of Vision Zero is going to be to lower speed limits, quite frankly. So um, come into town and you see a thing that says, unless otherwise posted 25 miles per hour, it's probably going to go down. And we'll probably look at all our streets so this will be a great baseline to start with. Yes. Because there's going to be a significant amount of traffic calling involved. You know, I, get, I live off 21st, and I know it's 35 miles an hour. People from over to Francis, people just drive race down that all the time because it's this big, open, straight street. Well, and I know that one of the earlier slides had people wanted more enforcement with speed limits. It seems a way to not have to have more people out giving tickets and a way to slow people down is just to make the roads a little windy. We are actually 21st is a great example because we're talking about quite frankly taking away a lane yeah. in each direction and making the it take, taking that lane and on the outsides in both directions and making that into a buffered bike lane. Yeah, because it, it seems like with traffic calming you can make easier paths for people yeah. to walk and bike and, and everything. Yeah. You slow people down and yeah, it seems like it, it, it's a way to accomplish a lot of those things without having to necessarily rely on just giving people a bunch of tickets. Right. And also looking at a number, number of places for new roundabouts. Yeah. So that's become very popular as far as being able to slow people down and entryway features and all that good stuff. That really kind of build up the community. Yeah. That could be a heat island mitigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and, 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 and I think for, I think one of the big barriers for walking, especially in the summer here, is just how little shade there is if you're trying to walk somewhere. Yes. And you know, it seems like having calming features like nature features and green buffers and trees, things that can damage cars, slow them down. Yeah, one of the things we made sure of to be in the new standards, well, this is standards on a number of years ago, was to make sure that every sidewalk, new sidewalk built in town was detached so that you had a tree line yeah. where you could put trees and they'd be, we'd be responsible basically because it'd be within the right of way. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, when Jim says traffic calming, I know that what you mean are physical barriers. Yeah. Um, 
I've looked at uh, how Vision Zero has played out in cities that have had it for a long time, and unfortunately, they seem to be very heavily focused on surveillance, and what's happening with that data is no bueno. Um, now, the companies that have developed these cameras have also developed the AI analysis and the automatic tickets that remove um, people from the from the um, any part of the process. Um, so there's really no judicial review on it. And um, the evidence seems to be that when people are live in an area where there's more cameras, they feel less secure because it's more alienating and they feel more paranoid. And I would rather see as much as possible um, uh, efforts made to make people right because they simply can't make a bad decision because there's a curve and there's bushes that you can't you know see around maybe as easily and there's an electric i mean you, have you guys seen the electric stop signs you know i think that that stuff really makes more you haven't seen those they, they blink at you there's one out on 17th is it on 17th it's at the airport, um, on, on 17th airport right but out by um mcintosh lake yeah. people Eclipse. used to like smash into those million dollar houses like yards all the time um, I thought it was hilarious when I first saw it. I was like, I'm hallucinating. Um, so yeah, as much as possible, I really, and, and every time, you know, Harold talks about how his smart, he said this at a, at a city um, a coffee with council. He said, when we talk about smart cities, we're talking about surveillance cameras. And we were all like, oh, we don't want any more of that. Take those out. Yeah, I, I, so. I, 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 I bicycle a lot around town and from here to other places and the kind of the, the, the basic rule that most cyclists believe is that anything that that drivers are more concerned about damaging their car than they are about hitting somebody. Yeah. And so if, if you have things that can damage cars, it slows people down. Right. It's we, the just, we just have to kind of measure that temperate mm -hmm. or balance it. So well, we, aren't, I mean, we aren't hurting people with that either because if we are a vision zero city, we just need to make sure we're balancing all those different if you're, if you're driving 30 miles an hour, you don't hit these things. It's only people who, yeah. are, who are speeding who do. Or who That's why we're talking about like reducing the lane widths where it's practical and, doing, it and doing some, yeah, yeah. moving people through. Yeah. We are, people. I'll be honest, we get, we get a lot of resistance from our public safety folks for yeah. a lot of that too. So we're working with them to have those conversations and just talk about, hey, if we're reducing crashes, yeah. that means you're. You're doing, you don't have to do all these calls, right? Yeah. So hopefully we can measure. It's all a balancing act at this point. Mm -hmm. So does public safety want more cameras, basically? I think the uh, police probably do for just, yeah. they're, they're using them for tracking like stolen vehicles through town right now. So they can track the license plate and just watch it and where it turn, where they turn. And once it kind of triggers in the system, they can figure out if that's a stolen car or not. Um, we're getting a lot of, we see how crashes happen and what's going on with the crashes. And so there's a lot of that technology, but we have not ins inserted the idea of um, like the speed cameras or the red light cameras just for those very concerns. And for the idea that early on, like the last you know, or 10 years ago when this kind of started out and Boulder really jumped on it, uh, or jumped on that technology was that there was a lot of almost like scam artists that were just doing this to get the money for the company, right? And so we got a piece of that ticket, but they really wanted a larger piece, you know, they wanted to make money. And so we kind of shied away from it for those reasons. It didn't seem, it didn't seem uh, ethical <laughs> in some ways. I lived in Aurora, which when we lived there, it was considered the most um, smart city, city in terms of traffic safety in the whole country. And we moved because we would be going home and we'd be one mile of the speed limit and we'd get a little ticket oh. with a picture of us going. <laughs> and it was just so horrible. And we were like, this is really unnecessary. We get you know perfect driving records and stuff. I think what we're looking for is maybe red light running running cams, because that's part of the safety issue. And if we can and there are more more there are crashes, more crashes, rear end crashes at those, but the severity of the crashes are reduced when we have a red light camera. So that's part of that vision zero aspect. We'll need to work with all the different departments to make that work. Yeah. I think, well, well, from based on my conversation about smart city technologies, that what they re they, they really want is fewer traffic stops and fewer chases, because those are dangerous for everyone concerned. 
And so if you get that done with street design or if you get that done with automation, they probably don't care which. They just don't want to have people up because every time somebody is stopped trying to, you know, pull somebody over and somebody over is trying to fill them and film them and, you know, all that yeah, stuff, all that, then they can't, you know, call a, a domestic, respond to a domestic review, abuse call. So that's the crazy. We just have more data for you, but uh, uh, this is all the kind of existing existing conditions. We're just measuring all the different speeds, the off-peak, the peak, and then the difference of those is kind of a very light bar. So you can kind of see where there's little differences. Highway 66, westbound. So, um, uh, but this is just all gonna go into our idea of how we do the roadway network, what needs to be looked at for the roadways. Bicycle network. Shows all our different ones. This is more traditional pieces of just looking at all what we have as far as, we have a lot more buffered bike lanes than we've ever had before, so that's exciting. Um, those are coming on. That wasn't something we talked about much in 2016 either. Uh, we have a couple of underpasses that are being constructed, so they aren't on here yet, but we've got some good things going on the east side of town to connect these links. Pedestrian network, we really just wanted to see where we have missing sidewalks based on that sidewalk issue of not connected and we think we do a pretty good job of connecting. Some of our sidewalks are deficient in that they're not wide and so it's very hard to walk even two by two on, on, on a sidewalk which is interesting but we do have some missing sidewalk. We just finished a project on 17 just east of Hover which has been amazing. It's a really good connection that we've been looking forward, forward to for a long time. Our transit network is pretty, pretty slim and so we are going to supplement this. You do see that we have an RTD flex ride service that does cover the entire area. And the micro transit <clears throat> will supplement that quite a bit. We're hoping to almost take it, take that over and get rid of the flex ride and have that put have RTD put more resources into our flex or our micro transit service based on that. So we're working with them on how micro transit will take care of that. Well, micro, go ahead. Oh, micro uh, Microtransit isn't going to go, going to do the door through door. No. So you don't completely via, get rid. Yeah, VIA will be out there still. Those smart mm -hmm. vehicles that do the door through door service for, mm -hmm. for people who uh, uh, people with disabilities and people older older population trying to make appointments to different medical appointments and shopping. Um, so just I, I remember this from a previous meeting. We talked about the different routes that the buses go down. And that it's actually because it's part of RTD, the city has limited kind of say in how the routes are arranged. Is that, it, it, am I remembering that correctly? Yes, and that's absolutely correct. Do we have an opportunity to, to try to work with them to make them less <laughs> serious? <laughs> we, do, we, do, we do have a lot of opportunities to make that work. Okay. And RTD just presented at our transportation advisory board on Monday. Okay. And they said how great it is to work with the city, and I kind of went there. And <laughs> <laughs> they said, "Yeah, we work with you, and we put our input in, but then it always always boils down to resources." Yeah. And they always say, "Well, you can't extend the route any further than this because of resources." Well, how do we work with you, <laughs> you know, to build better routes? We want more frequencies on different routes. We think a 15-minute headway, you know, coming by every 15 minutes, going along southbound Main Street, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We think a lot of people would take that in northbound as well, but just trying to, there's a kind of a blended headway yeah. there that turns. But, uh, and they see that and they realize it, but there's just not the resources to put out there right now. You'll see that we have a lot of loops and weird little yeah. things that just kind of end, and that's not the way we really envision the system. So, our idea is to start with micro transit and work our way into the transit realm a little bit that way. I think the key piece here too is this will all change with the bus rapid transit that's yeah. coming in 2027. So we will get a route that goes out to the east side of town. Uh, we'll have more frequency on some of these buses to get people into what's going to be the first and main station right here. So this will all change over the next three years. This just kind of gives you the idea of uh, how much ridership we have. Uh, this, is, this is interesting because there's almost as many people per day on the 324 local bus is, there, is on the Bolt between Boulder and Longmont. So 
we do have a free bus service in town. And I hope everybody knows that we don't. It is 80% of that right now. <laughs> yeah. So she knows all about that good. Um, but this is, this is what's kind of out there. And you'll see some of these very deficient routes. Uh, unfortunately, we have this LD. It says Longmont to Denver, but it's really more like Longmont to, to Broomfield. And then you have to transfer to get to Denver, which is painful. Here's our flex route. So this carries, um, these, these buses uh, do pretty well. Uh, this is a bus that comes from Fort Collins. So we've, we work with a completely different transit agency on this, on the flex route. So uh, they come, obviously they just have two stops. In, well, they have three stops in town, but one of them it's kind of more for the boulder down or the boulder trip or going all the way through town so uh, we can't go to boulder on this bus <laughs> even though it goes to boulder you're not supposed to you're supposed to use the rtb system which is bizarre to me you can't do it but the, it's all based on the driver so that's kind of nice uh here's a little bit more about the safety pieces that this is really going to feed into our vision zero piece but it really is important to the tmp as well uh, the idea of bicycle involved collisions so really a concentration on this main street corridor from 17th basically on the north to about um, our downtown maybe long speak on the south looks like and so and you'll see little there's little piece, pieces out in different areas too kind of up here at 66 and main too and then all along the main street corridor pedestrian involved collisions again along Main Street, around 17th, and then south of downtown, or in downtown, down to 3rd Avenue, basically, so between 3rd and Long's Peak, and 3rd and 5th. Uh, so you can kind of see that. Crash types, this is just gonna help us more about the crash data piece. A lot of rear-end crashes, as you can imagine. It's the one where we start talking about broadside crashes. Those are the ones that get pretty dangerous, and that's where people start to spend time in hospitals or end up um, losing a loved one in this. So those are critical for us to, to reduce those in the next set of uh, Vision Zero piece. So we do have a new Vision Zero coordinator who started working with us in uh, February. And we do have an action plan that's going forward. We're going to get the action plan done and that'll give us uh, ability to uh, access resources, money. So we'll have more money to be able to spend on these things. Going then the next steps, we, we need to put together that vision and goals for this project to make sure that we're all aligned as a community on those. And develop those recommendations for bicycle, walking, transit, the vehicle network, and then programs and policies. The idea is we really want to flip the script. We've always talked about kind of cars first, and then buses, and then bikes, and then walking. We want to flip that script so it's walking first, bicycling, transit, and then even before personal automobiles getting freight freight um, delivered through the town as, as we talked about earlier, and then the personal vehicle. So we'll be back here to talk to stakeholders. We do have a member of the SAB on, on, that, on that working group. So uh, we'll be getting together again in the next couple of weeks here or next couple of months to get back together and start to work on, on a lot of this vision and goals and some of this. You said there's somebody from this group who's on that? Yeah, I'm trying to remember who it is. Yeah, Charles. 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 Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we're going to need a new person. Yeah, we, yeah. we are losing him, though. He's okay. moving away. So. <laughs> oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah. So, how does so, that happen? How does that. Is that something that we formally decided that somebody from this group was going to was somebody who volunteered. I think yeah. Charles volunteered. We were to asked to volunteer at one meeting, and Charles volunteered okay. because he cycles a lot. Great men of vested interest. Yeah. And then there will be opportunities for Phil to come back to this group also. Okay. I'm asking for a yeah. <laughs> volunteer. Well, also, and, and hopefully, like, when you have recommendations and stuff like that, to I, um, I, I volunteered it to go to Charles twice until we get somebody else who is an avid cyclist in that sense, which is not me. I wish it. Hopefully we answered all your questions during the presentation. So if there are any other follow-up questions, let me know or feel free to give them to Lisa or Francis. That's super informative. Yeah, thank, you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I have one last question about this and it's an intersectional question. There just seems to be so much angst right now about HOAs 
and the um, obviously this intersects a lot with with transportation because there are the requirements for um, the HOAs to put in um, various kinds of islands and I don't know what they're called like strips you know like along the roads and so forth and um, do, I, I do have many conversations with the HOA and I know that a lot of people are trying to pull off turf and so on and so forth and um, as you bring in more buses and more roundabouts and such are you what is what are the issues that are coming up with the HOAs I know there's going to be some just because I'm trying to learn about all things HOAs right now yeah I'm not not hearing that as much so okay. most of the issues with HOAs right now seem to be allowing for accessory dwelling units and more density within subdivisions so that's what we're really dealing with HOAs is how do they change um, their rules to be able to allow that? Because we have rules in the city that allow for it, and anybody can do it until you get to the HOA level of politics. And so that's the that's the point that we're really struggling with right now. Is it going to change? It's also going to change um, um, parking too. And then again, a lot of that open space that they have in the HOAs. Again, like I've talked about, like the um, the rolling strips and so forth. A lot of that stuff's going to have to be taken out to put in more parking and such, right? Well, we're actually getting rid of, we're going to get rid of parking minimums. So we're not going to, as a city, force folks, and this is even due to our council member because we're going to bring back two resolutions now instead of just the one. Mm -hmm. Because our internal working group of city departments came up with the idea that maybe parking maximums, maybe we're ready for parking maximums only. Oh, yeah. So they're going to get rid of parking minimums. So we're going to bring that to council. Uh, May 14th. So I, I snoozed around and found yeah. out who was nervous about parking minimums. Okay. So <laughs> you wouldn't doubt them, but um, yeah. yeah. I'm so I'm, I'm glad that you're convinced. <laughs> yes, um, we convinced folks. Yeah. So we're going to get rid of all parking minimums. So the city will no longer say you have to put in this much parking for even multifamily residential. We're going to let the, let the developers tell us how much parking they think they need. And if we see that it's going to impact surrounding neighborhoods, then we're going to make them do a parking study to prove to it, prove to us that that's what's needed. But we're going to put caps on parking from here on out, and so you'll see that. Are you sure that's what the public wants? Because I've heard people come. I've heard a whole neighborhood come to uh, the copy of council. I think it was the last one, and they were completely freaked out because there was no parking in their neighborhood. They, there was no place for them to park and they couldn't believe they hit the design that way. I, I understand that this is very popular in uh, civic planning right now and in transportation and energy policy, but I don't think it's what the public wants. Right, we're having lots of conversations. So um, It's also has come up in my neighborhood in multiple instances. They want to put in slant parking people said no. There, there's been instances of trying to put in developments where there was um, only like 20% of the um, housing in, in that, uh, of the housing units would actually have a parking space, which would cramp the neighborhood. And I'm just really concerned about this. That's uh, very understandable. I, we, I think that's why we got to the place where we did with our city set, because there was this huge concern. Mm -hmm. Every time that we try to bring data to the conversation, we hope that that helps. Uh, but obviously there's that perception that it's that that's not going to work and so we're just trying to get through that perception level with with data and so trying to prove to folks that really a lender won't give money to a development that can't prove that it has enough parking and so what is a lender a lender a lender, a lender excuse me oh, a lender. <laughs> okay. okay yeah okay. A, a bank a bank will not lend dollars to especially in, in cities like Walmart that they perceive as not having great transit yet and so what we're trying to do is supplement these gaps with better transit and we're hoping that people can actually make it make that next step of do I have to own three vehicles or two vehicles or even one vehicle for my family to get around or can I do it in these other ways and obviously if you don't have great transit and bicycling options a car is your only way and you got to store that car somewhere so it's all those conversations that we're trying to have with folks and so Places that are not very transit rich, we may have to look at that parking differently than places along the downtown core where we have lots of transit, walking, and bicycling uh, 
possibility. There's, uh, I think, another thing, um, which is that for new developments, um, our planners will make sure that the street design and the path design and the greenway connectivity and all of that are going to automatically be um, an improvement over how things are in the old neighborhoods, and um, and you know they can they can require um, as long as our code is clear enough. Right. And we're working on it, aren't we, Phil? Um, but uh, you know that that that. Uh, uh, we won't have to fight with the HOA that comes after because it's already going to be right. Um, so, uh, and an HOA can't tell us, can't tell people how to park. I don't think that's, or how many parking well, spaces per room. I don't think it's with HOA. I think it's the people who move there and they say, why is there no parking in our neighborhood? We didn't realize this ahead of time. This is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, the, the specific thing that was said by these folks there, I think when we did development, it's up by 66 and it's townhomes. And they said, our driveways are just on ramps into the garage. There's no place to park a car in the driveway and there's no place to park cars on the street. And the development behind us, um, they're planning and putting in, um, you know, as, as dense as we have with less parking available. And I just, I don't think that people want that here. And so when you say new developments, A, what new developments? <laughs> We're running out of land. And B, it seems like there's an awful lot of remediation that has to happen right now because things happen without people being really adequately surveyed. I'm just trying to say that that's yep. <laughs> So, um, sorry to cut off the conversation, but I we do have another presentation that I want to get to. So, but if you all have other thoughts, please feel free to email myself or Bill, um, and I'll coordinate with Bill on um, when he'll be able to come back later in the process. So. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks. Very informative. I don't think we're here. This is the most the most It's like all the places. This is the most mouthful of a title when I was like, what do you want me to call it? I was like, okay. That's terrible. There's no other way to say it. So how come people think that they get to rule over other people's land? Okay, sorry, I'm gonna move y'all on to the <laughs> Hi everybody, um, I'm Hannah Mulroy. I'm the uh, Energy Portfolio Development Manager here for the City of Longmont, work with Longmont Power and Communications. I know you know Susan fairly well because she's here all the time. She's my direct supervisor, so I work on Susan's team, Energy Strategies and Solutions. I actually haven't had a chance to be in front of you formally all. I know I spoke briefly about DERs a few months back when I had a short opportunity, but I'm really glad to be here today. Um, I, I don't want to say this negatively, but I wish I was here to talk about all the really exciting DER stuff we're doing, but this really is a little bit more um, procedural, um, rule making, so just kind of getting some underlying things that we've identified as um, some gaps in our current um, policies and rate compensations for solar as well as the renewable power purchase program. So I'm going to go through some things with you today. We went to council last week on this um, and had a pretty good discussion. We've gotten some feedback from them that we are working on, so we're releasing some changes to this as time goes on, um, but this is where we're at now and um, I'm going to try and explain it as best as I can. We'll go for that. Um, so briefly, I just want to say um, what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to start with just the timeline of where we are now and how I plan to move through the, the summer, kind of our public engagement and when we expect to return to council. I'm going to talk to you about interconnection standards, so how we connect distributed energy resources to our electrical grid, and then um, the solar rate analysis, which has two components, the amount we pay for net excess energy coming off the solar systems, as well as our renewable power purchase program that folks subscribe to, so that folks covered up that last item. Um, so just now I want to talk about where we are now, we're actually at the third bullet. So we went to council retreat back in February to provide a high level overview of distributed energy resources and kind of touched on lightly the fact that we needed to look at modifying or modernizing, I should say, our interconnection standards, our solar rates and our RTPP program. Um, we went back to them last week with some review and recommendations. So that's 
what we've been through. Now we're in the public engagement stage. I don't actually have my public engagement slide on this, but I'll let you know you're kind of the first body I'm coming to outside of council. My intention is to spend the next three months um, going to quite a few other uh, entities, sustainability coalition, sustainable resilient lawnmower, equitable climate action team, um, and some others that I feel like I'm forgetting one. Because a bunch of folks. Um, we're also going to be reaching out to solar installers, people in the permitting pipeline. We're going to go to newspapers, blogs, sustainability newsletters. So everything you hear today, we're going to spend the summer really getting the, the news out there as best as we can. Um, that things we're considering changing. Um, then we're going to go for council direction and ordinance approval. This is pending that we're on our current timeline and nothing changes dramatically over the summer. Um, in the budget season, so kind of later this summer, early fall, because other things to do with rates and, and money come through then, we're going to plan to return to council for further discussion, let them know what we've heard from the public, and then if they're feeling comfortable, seek direction from them to prepare an ordinance. If we need more time, we'll take more time. Um, then we plan to actually come back and do some pretty robust public education. Hey, these changes are actually happening. Please get in your permit or please do your interconnection, whatever we want to kind of let folks know. The intention as of now is that any changes we're talking about today are proposed to take effect January 1st of next year. So we want to take the summer to kind of get feedback and then come late fall, or, uh, I'm sorry, late summer or fall, if we know the changes are happening, really put out a message that January 1st is the date that the intended change, the rules are changing. Um, all right, so what are we talking about? Interconnection. So um, interconnection policies are guidelines for how distributed energy resources are connected to our electrical grid, in this case our distribution electrical grid. I want to clarify the term distributed energy resources is a pretty broad catch-all term, so it often means thermostats and water meters and EVs and all these things. In this case, we really do mean um, what we call bi-directional distributed energy resources, so solar energy, battery storage, and eventually vehicle to grid charging, if that, that's a thing. <laughs> when that's a thing, it's anything that's gonna back feed onto our grid because that provides a whole lot of other things we have to look at in terms of the ability to serve them safely and otherwise we need to make sure systems shut down, we shut down. So really we're looking at those, those systems that back feed. Um, and we have kind of unclear or inconsistent policies and we find some of them present barriers to development by causing delays or increases in cost. So generally we have uh, interconnection policy goals um, that we want to enable um, distributed energy resources while also protecting our and safeguarding our grid. We want to align with regional and state interconnection standards for consistency. So currently some of our standards are off with what other utilities have. So installers don't necessarily know what to expect. So we kind of want to standardize, modernize some of our standards. The next one, we want to modernize standards to address emerging technologies and demand response opportunities. Specifically, our current standards are only with solar generation or generation at the end, um, and do not address battery storage, and we need to address battery storage. Um, we want to provide flexibility in our standards, particularly when it comes to solar generation, to enable building and ele uh, transportation electrification, so we want folks to be able to produce enough uh, energy on site to serve their needs. Um, we want to update standards to allow for faster review and fewer failed permits. Currently, we are failing a decent amount of permits on the 120% of allowed generation rule. So folks are coming in, not generally asking for 200 and even close to that. Usually it's like 136 or 147, like they want just a little more than we're able to give them. And I have no release valve currently to let them do that. And it's something that I would like to change, that we say we need to generate comes to me for a decision. Um, and then we want to establish equitable provisions to require engineering studies for distributed energy resources, both a big one, so a two megawatt solar system comes on, but also a bunch of solar are happening on one feeder, for example. Right now, we're looking at it kind of case by case. We haven't seen a lot of big installations, but we are expecting big installations. So we need to be able to say, hey, you got to go pay for and do a system impact study and tell us what kind of upgrades might be needed in the case of a big installation, for example. Small, ins small installations, how can we help those residents make those improvements and not kind of hit the last person on the line? No, everybody else could do it, but not the last guy. So how can we kind of study that ahead of time with some system impact studies involved? Um, so I have, I wish this was a little bit bigger. Um, top box, I'll do my best. But essentially I've identified what was when we came to council five shortcomings and now there's six. Um, and five proposed changes to address those shortcomings. Currently, as I mentioned, Solar generation is limited to 120% of annual consumption. We would like to increase that to a system size of 12 kW or 200%, whichever is greater. 
Um, generally speaking, from our knowledge, uh, Fort Collins is a similar 12 kW. What we intend to do is if you put a 12 kW system or less, from a consumption standpoint, we're going to approve you. We're not going to ask for consumption numbers. We're just 12 kW or under, we're good. Still going to look at transformer, conduit, panel, all of that. But basically, if you have 12 kW or less, we're not going to bid you. Um, for anyone who wants a little bigger system, which does happen, we will look at the 200% rule. Um, and then we also have no provision for new construction, new ownership or electrification, and I actually have some further information on this. So what we'd like to do is allow a 6 kWh per square foot for new construction, new ownership, or adoption of electrification measures. So what that is essentially is that we did an analysis of 23,000 single family um, homes in the city and asked that figured out how much they use per square foot. This includes new homes, old homes, good envelopes, bad envelopes, um, and all electric, we found some outliers, you know, all, all gas, whatever the case may be, and a 6 kWh per square foot would serve the typical home at 200%. Um, if we go a little bit higher than that, we'd actually be more, at 6%, we figure about 50% of people would already potentially be going over 200%, so we, we might not want to go any more generous with that. And the third thing, which I forgot to mention, I had an old brain fog at council last week, uh, right, went back to my desk, is that currently we have no variance procedures for folks who want to electrify. I'm a new owner, I have an EV, I got a heat pump, I you know, I need all these things, and we're just like, well, you need to kind of prove it to us, or show us that. We want to have a variance process that allows folks to show us documentation that they're installed, a heat pump, an EV, whatever the case may be, and that they need a bigger system. We have language in there for an administrative approval of a larger system size. Um, we're kind of trying to do, what do we do to have, like, deal with the average person and then have a re release valve for those kind of outliers, which we have, and I understand that people are frustrated. Um, so again, so that we have no system, I said this before, but the standards are limited to only generation, not uh, battery storage or other distributed energy resources. So we need to include other DERs. We've got to uh, expand it to battery storage and bi-directional EV charging, which again is not actually fully viable at any sort of commercial level or programmatic level, but we do anticipate in the future these rules would also apply to that, that use. No provisions for engineering studies. Um, so what we're planning to do is, or we've already worked on, and my engineers over there, is the uh, LAMA Distributed Energy Resource Interconnection Standards document. Um, as some of you may be aware, a lot of our development is outside kind of standards document. This is how you build a road. This is how you do public works. We're going to do a similar thing where we have the code will say, you need to interconnect. Please go see these standards. And we have about a 40-page standards document. It's really technical. We're going to have companions of checklists and kind of FAQ is related to it, but it really is for technical experts and it has all the provisions of what you need to do to provide us a study, what we're looking for from your study, what, you know, how can you mitigate impacts on the grid, who's responsible for what. Um, we have system size thresholds, so at certain system sizes, again, as we expect larger systems, um, you'll trigger additional things, such as a production meter. Um, so that's all kind of contained in there, and the ordinance is going to be really simplified to just kind of go see the standards. Um, and then last one is that we lack industry standard communications or data protocols. So we don't have anything currently that says your DER has to talk to us in our way, your solar has to tell us this, your battery has to tell us this, and we want to be able to tell you something. Um, we want to establish industry standards, communication protocols for grid monitoring, signaling, and future VPP or demand response. So we want to be able to, oh, your EVs there, your battery's there, can we call on it? You're going to tell us how full it is. And it's IEEE is the, the industry standard, so it's IEEE. That I know about that, but I'll give you guys some. <laughs> the EPPA is their whole oh, power plant. Yes. Are you guys people are familiar with it? Thank you. It's a demand response opportunity, but it was too long and they had a shortage. <laughs> <laughs> do you have yeah. a question? Well, I, I, I do. Um, I have a colleague who can talk, speaking of setting standards, and especially regarding interconnect, mm -hmm. I have a colleague who can talk about nothing but grid forming inverters. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand the role of a grid forming inverter if I live on 40 acres out east and and I don't want a, a provider at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to get on the transmission lines or something. Yeah. You know, that I understand. I don't understand the role of such devices where you are, have a hybrid situation where you're generating part of your own electricity and you're on a distribution grid as well. I can think of. Well, at least one application and someone else can come in if they want, but if we were to develop any microgrids within the city where they're primarily served, um, let's say they want a five megawatt battery and a one megawatt solar to serve this thing, that would be, a, we would want it to be, if they want to be able to serve 
right out of blackout, right, or something, or an outage. We would want that to be a grid forming inverter, so that when our power is shut off, it's automatically anti-island, it doesn't get back feed, and it becomes a grid, in, a grid forming inverter. We haven't seen any applications of that yet, um, but I have seen it in uh, micro, like urban microgrid. Well, so you know, uh, we, we, we may, in, if the sugar mill brouhaha ever gets, yes. um, ever, ever gets resolved, then those are very progressive developers and they were probably microgrid. Yeah, groups. and I know we haven't seen anything from Modern West yet, but I know they're thinking of some pretty radical stuff energy wise up there. We'll know more as we get further into it. But you're right, usually grid forming inverters, and we would also expect it maybe on a big battery installation that it becomes grid forming, meaning it serves as a backup generator with no back bed feeding into the grid. Um, we haven't necessarily, it's not a prohibition to have one, right? Sorry, I'm looking at Frank because he knows no, more about inverters than I do. <laughs> And my name is Frank Mandelor, I'm a senior electrical engineer over at Longmont Power and Communications. And I helped you know, work with the panel on the DER interconnection standards. But um, there are certain ways that grid forming inverters can connect to the system and still maintain operational status if the grid goes down and do so safely. And that's something that wouldn't that is covered in our interconnection standards. It just depends on the characteristics of the specific interconnection details so we would have to look at that but there's nothing that would pro prohibit that from being approved as long as it meets all the other connection standards that we have established so okay it's not it's not like going to push back too hard or anything like that make a mess Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it is to your point it tends to be more of a rural application yeah. um, but there are certainly um, circumstances and maybe be at our own facilities that we would want a battery with a grid of right. so that we could ride out of so uh, since we said we've brought up microgrids um, have you considered neighborhoods that want to retrofit to create a microgrid say in a block we have yet to be approached by anything like that. Um, we would like work. We might. We might. Yeah, yeah. and we so would certainly need the standards in it. You're going to need the inverters. Yep. Yeah. In yeah. So that, like, as Frank said, it would be covered yeah. in here. They would come and say, "Hey, we want solar, or we only want battery," <laughs> yeah. and then we would propose work with them on the inverter specs as part of the permitting interconnection and study to show that they have the correct inverters to do grid supporting. And so, I so is it, I'm presuming that there's going to be some work with budgeting so that. If a neighborhood wants to, or if a block wanted to do that, there would be some capacity within the city to help build those specs for that, or would the neighborhood have to build it all themselves? I can't speak to financial support uh, uh, regarding developing microgrids. I'm just wondering if there's been communication about that. Again, so, it's not something we've been approached about, so we have to help yet to have conversation about it. We, like we, we are, we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but it's, okay, so I just think there should be, yeah, that might. Further conversation. Right. I just I just wanted a little more clarification on the question. So if there was a um, if there was a block that wanted to microgrid, I'm curious what the support would be at LPC for putting that together. That's basically the most simplest way to put it. Yeah. Or developing uh, developing the spec, the developing the plan. Oh, yeah. yeah. If there would you know if there was any I get I get help. From there's always just seems like that's there's a always technical yeah. thing. There's definitely technical assistance always available to our yeah. developers. Okay. Um, so if they came to us wanting to achieve that, we would work with them very closely to achieve that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But as yeah. far as um, you know, designing the system, I think that would happen outside. We can work with whatever that yeah. design partner yeah. is proposing, but but okay. we wouldn't be. Curious yeah, it's pretty the routine. Conversation yeah, it's routine conversation. for you know somebody come with us a solar installation. We say, hey, maybe you should do it this way or choose yeah, it. Yeah. So okay. we do have that kind of cooperative relationship with the developers. Okay, I think that is all on my interconnection, and the solar rate potentially could be seen as a little more complicated. So I'm going to move on to the solar rate unless we have any more interconnection. I've done a little bit more of a truncated version of this. If you want more information, the full presentation was presented to council, and I'm happy to chat with you all. But I tried to keep it a little bit simpler today than it has been. Um, so we included two, I worked very closely, we have our, our rates manager over there, I worked really closely with their rates team um, for quite a period of time now, I'm almost my two years with LPC, on um, doing the uh, credit rate for net metering, or what we call the solar rate analysis, and then also looking at our renewable power purchase program, which is the, the voluntary program folks, um, folks buy into or participate in, I should say. 
I'm gonna take a moment, I'm sure most of you know this, but I'm gonna take a moment to level set on what net metering is and why there are some potential equity or um, equitable considerations that need to be talked about with this. So currently the city buys our uh, city credits, both our residential and commercial customers for their net excess energy. So that we need that they use, they produce more energy than they use in a month, we credit to them at retail value. If they have remaining bank at the end of the year, we also credit that to them in retail. We don't have as many customers that haven't had their bank at the end of the year, but that month, month currently is retail. Um, like I said, uh, or that also, also the customers receive a retail credit for all the energy they produce and consume on site. What that's trying to say, and maybe not the best way I know how that's written, is that essentially is you, what I call, say, you get inherently retail for everything you consume. So when your solar is producing and you're consuming, that's always a retail value because you are not buying one kilowatt hour at a retail. So we really do try and encourage folks to consume what they use on site to the best of their ability. And this doesn't go into a much but store when possible. We are looking at um, opportunities to incentivize and support battery storage, and that would help kind of bolster the economics because anything stored or consumed on site is retail. Um, the city pays a premium to customers for net metering credits above what we would have otherwise paid the Platte River Power Authority for the same energy. And the money to pay this credit comes out of the pocket of all of our ratepayers and takes away revenue from other projects that we could accomplish, other renewable energy projects, um, so on and so forth. This is a really well studied trend across the country. It's kind of all anybody talks about at the solar level is the way that we've been kind of as an industry paying folks for the retail uh, retail for the net excess energy has a um, inequitable subsidy connotation to it because the money to pay those folks are usually coming out of pockets that don't have as much money. So we recognize as many utilities as a couple of years ago, we need to look at how look at changing this, and we spent quite a lot of time looking at how we might go about changing that. Um, before I get into the potential changes for that, this is something we spent some time doing and I uh, want to spend a little bit describing is that this is the excess purchase power annual expense. So essentially is that is the cost, the premium, the delta between wholesale and retail. What does that cost us year over year in subsidies if solar keeps growing the way we think it's going to? So this is a solar growth chart. This is how much solar we think we're going to get by 2043. This is information you, that is based on a distributed energy resource um, forecast uh, and analysis that we have between Pat River Power Authority that we think we're going to get 81 megawatts by 2043. If that continues, in 2043, at the retail rate, we will be paying a subsidy of $3.32 million to our solar customers by 2043. Per year. Per year, annually, yes. That's not cumulative, which is this might be the case. So right now we're paying sixty three, sixty four thousand dollars a year. So it's not a ton, um, but it is increasing, and we do see a lot of solar growth. And retail rates also will go up over time. So that takes into consideration the increase in retail rates over time. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I'm going to go to a recommendation slide because I, I cut out again. I kind of cut out a couple slides. I'm going to tell you a couple things to help put some context on this. So we have a couple. Proposed changes, um, specifically where it comes to the, the value, so I'm sorry, the, the credit rate, but I want to explain two terms that are on the proposed changes side. One is the legacy retail rate. We are proposing to put everyone who is on, a, so, or has a solar system on the date that the rate becomes, the new rate becomes effective, to get a legacy rate and pay retail for a period of time. At council last week, we had proposed a 20 year legacy rate. We heard feedback that that may be a little on the long side, so we're doing modeling of a 10, uh, I think. 2030, 10 and 15 years, like by 2030, 10 and 15 years, and kind of see what that looks like. But we are wanting to kind of preserve the economic model that our solar, um, existing solar customers went into it with. We also know most of our solar have been installed in just the last few years, so they have quite a lot of life left on them. So we do want to give them some sort of generous legacy rate. And then anyone moving forward um, would be placed on what we're calling, and not what, we're, what is called, a value of solar credit rate for new customers. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is what that means. So value of solar is a kind of new methodology for paying back folks for the net excess energy that is a rate that accurately reflects the local benefits of solar generation. Um, so our chosen global generation benefit is an 18% premium above wholesale. So paying 18% above what we pay Platte River to our solar customer to reflect the local benefits. Those include a 3% mine loss, so we're paying for 3% of mine loss coming from Platte River and 15% environmental benefits. 
This was based on substantial best practice research of valued solar studies all over the country, and uh, about 15% is what is found to be environmental benefit. The uh, few, you know, re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, particulate matter, fugitive, um, and one I actually just read about or heard yes the other day was reduced land use impacts, which I thought was a really interesting one. Is that we have seven megawatts of behind the meter solar, that's 10 acres of land that we're not using for solar, which was very interesting, one I hadn't thought about before. Given that I'm a land use planner by trade, I should probably have thought about that before, but we'll forget about that. So what we're recommending we want to do is, so currently without any changes to the current rate structure, as we've talked about, ratepayers will subsidize solar customers $3.32 million by 2043. If we implement an institute legacy rate as modeled for 20 years, because that's the only number I have right now, and 18% value of solar, we can reduce that to a $1.3 million subsidy per year by 2043. So that is our proposal and what we're bringing and kind of socializing through all the different entities. Um, so that's kind of on the rate side. And then I didn't have a slide on it, but I just want to touch on this briefly, is that with the Renal Renewable Lot Power Purchase Program, um, the Platter Power Authority, it used to be the, the 3.12 cents, I believe, kilowatt hour, um, in addition to your, your uh, credit rate. And that was based on tariff seven, not that I'm going to, but it was, you paid tariff to Black River for renewable sources. The tariff was eliminated in 2019, 20 maybe. We no longer put it in 2020. 20, great. Um, COVID happened. Uh, staff changeover, I came a little bit after the fact. Um, we've known for a little bit that that needed to be adjusted, but we wanted to roll it in with the rest of the rate rates. So Brian and I worked, our rates manager and I worked with Platte River to um, determine a more accurate reflection of what are we paying additionally to Platte River for the wind energy that the RECs are being retired on behalf of our participants on. And that's actually closer to a 1.7% premium, so it's a 60% reduction in the renewable power purchase costs. So our recommendation is that we adjust our rate, of six, reduce it by 60% to 1.7 cents per renewable power purchase program. Participants, which is my favorite thing to say, I have to say that 10 times a day, uh, January 1st, 2025, and moving forward. Um, and then the other thing is generally, um, up until my time with the city, that those funds were more just in the general, kind of general fund of LPC and did support the Platte River Power Authority purchase of wind, obviously, but we had made efforts to more directly account for the budget and the income, covered revenue, I should say, coming from that program to invest more locally in Walmart specific renewable energy projects. And one such thing actually passed recently that we got approval through an intergovernmental agreement, so an IGA with Walmart Housing Authority, that we at LPC are um, of subsidizing them. Uh, the infrastructure upgrade costs at Village on Main. So if you're familiar with Village on Main, Six and Kaufman, the low income senior housing. Longmont Housing Authority is doing a really major renovation of the whole building as they do every 20 years and they're in there and they're taking off a thermal wa hot water solar system that is defunct up there and they're putting solar PV on themselves, 165 gig energy system. Um, to offset their their own bills, and they're going to use that to support serve, um, support resident services in the building. Um, when they came back, they could essentially finance and afford the solar, but the infrastructure to go from seventy two individual meters to a commercial panel and meter to support the size system was one hundred fifty thousand dollars that they had not factored into their cost. So we came, they, we've been partnered them on a variety of things. They came to us and we worked with them and we allocated the RPP funds to be collected this year to offset that infrastructure cost. So pretty exciting thing. And it's kind of new way of spending some money. So um, pretty exciting stuff. And we will be working on new projects with that, um, those funds moving forward. And that is actually all I have to do. So it's kind of a mouthful of a title. <laughs> Three topics that I've been working on. So, um, you brought up DPP sort of as a little tag. Yeah, of course. Seems like, since you're a planner, yeah. you've probably taken the, the weekend MBA in, in, in DPP type training. So, I'm going to ask it. I mean, this presentation begs the question if we actually went to a real DPP model, wouldn't all of these concerns go away about equity? No, not necessarily. Okay. Um, so even in the BPP model, so we're modeling our, our virtual power plant. So those numbers that came up, hey, we're going to have 81 megawatts of solar and battery. And you're modeling through LPC, not PRPA. 
We are not only as part of PRPA because we are one and the same. So they have come out with them collaborate, not one and the same, but we oh, we all work together collaboratively. Uh, one of the wholesalers so that we, would be part of the VPP if it was not. PRPA. So we're working really, really closely with Pet River. We have a Durham's roadmap, and we're going out for okay. a Dur I'm sorry, distributed energy resource management system, yeah. which is like the enterprise kind yeah. of market participation version of the VPP. Right. Um, we actually are finalizing a review of an RFP going out to look for a Derms and VPP vendor with Pet River. Should okay. their chosen vendor serve our distribution needs, then we plan to opt in with them and develop a VPP in coordination okay. with Pet River, Loveland, and Estes Park. Fort Collins has their own VPP okay. provider, but they'll be working in concert with us as well. And that's something else I've been working on for two years with. Okay, yeah. I'm interested in learning more. Really yeah, well. absolutely. I can come sure, back I'm just to sit, I'm just going to sit down with you. Yeah. Got lots of information. <laughs> so, so are we all, but um, there is a, another gap here, which is the definition of wholesale. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that is a good question, Mark. It is a it is a defined term in the word. The first time I learned about the PRPA. Yeah. Well, but but at some point, you know, I mean, they're in an energy market, and and their wholesale costs of energy are going to vary based on the renewable supply and stuff and the energy market is not up to snuff in terms of telling you what you're paying for when you pay a rate on the spot market and so we have no idea how that's going to reflect the whole the, the um, wholesale rate that they charge us for our demand and we kind of really can't implement this until we know that. Well, they'd have to buy futures so far out in order to really make a difference. I mean, the eco eco I think the economics here is a really big question that's for another time. But oh, sure. All of these questions are coming in as I was watching this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, right now they define they define the wholesale rate for how long, right. but it's flat per year. The rate is set per year. It's just, right. Yeah, it's set per year. So we can count on them maybe doing that for a few years. Right. Um, yeah. But at some point, it's going to have to float. And of course, allowing wholesale rates out here is going to incentivize people to purchase batteries, right. which is a behavior that we want. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it seems to me that PRPA is dragging its feet in terms of getting that act together. And it's too. Uh, we don't have the depth of, of bench to address that on our own because I've stuck my toe into it and it's freaking hard. <laughs> the liability that PRPA um, incurs by setting any rates more than a year, uh, you know, could be very destabilizing for the uh, for the market if there's too much of a fluctuation. And the people who are buying their solar panels are not economists. They're, I mean, Kate, maybe you can speak to this. They're trying to amortize, you know, and weigh their costs and their payoff, you know, just kind of like on the back of the envelope. So this is a really, it just seems to me that the more, more comprehensive our VPP approach is, and the more um, we sort of like lateralize the production of energy and allow for folks to put up the solar on their parking lots and all of those things, the more we take the, these economic risks out of the picture. But anyway, as I said, mm -hmm. the whole economics is a, is a completely different subject. Well, the, I mean, at some point, wholesale is going to fluctuate yeah. like a market. Yeah. yeah. Supply well, and demand yeah. all the way through to the consumer. Well, That's well right. it does now, right? The cost of fuel, does, yeah. the cost of labor, That's the right. cost of spare parts, the cost of maintenance. Right. The cost of energy purchased on the market, all of those things are not fixed. No, and of so course not. So, what Fiber does they, is they try to do an analysis, and Lance can speak with this better than I can, but they do an analysis of this is what we expect the price to be for the year 2025. And so, based on that, this is what the rate is for us to buy from them at a flat rate through the whole year. And at the end of the year, there's a true up. It's like, oh, we charged you too much, then that rolls over into next year, or we didn't charge you enough, that means there's going to have to be a larger rate increase, right? So, it floats. They absorb that shock, but at the end of the day, we do have a number that we can point to for that year that says this is wholesale price. For a while, but we're talking about a, a, a time in, 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 you know, as soon as possible when um, 
you know, we're gonna we're gonna deal with behaviors of the energy supply like the duck curve and and we're we're gonna want people to charge their vehicles and, and, and their batteries when it's free, which means wholesale comes in real time or near real time all the way home to the consumer and that's what a VPP does. So yeah, well, so the VPN charges people to get their own energy and then they can manage their costs. Well, the DERMS component of the VPP, like the DERMS would talk to our VPP and say, hey, energy's cheap or free right now. Everybody charge your cars. Everybody charge your batteries. Yes. And that's yes. part of those interconnection standards, right? Is that we need to actually right. figure out the, the protocol for Yeah, that. to actually tell them that. Mm -hmm. Because there are going to be a, a, a double handful full of serious geeks that are going to want to do that from their phone, and the rest of it, the system's going to have to do it for them. Totally. Don't we have other issues that we have to get through? Where are we at time? Sorry, I know you've had your hand up. I just want to. But I, I want to wanna... talk about this more. I think that this is a really big concern. Yes. So. And again, I'm happy to have even return at some point to have a more robust distributed energy resource conversation because I know we had kind of that one off opportunity a few months back, and then this again is a little bit on the regulatory side of things. Um, well, and uh, Black River is going to be coming back to the city council in June. Yeah. June? June? June 25th. Didn't they, didn't it wasn't it originally supposed to be March? No, I think they were thinking of May. I'm going to interrupt on behalf of Michelle and say that we have 10 minutes to do things like decide how we're going to choose the I just I'll, I'll be pretty brief. No, I mean, so I, one thing about I, I, I think solar on people's houses is fantastic. I'm curious about the actual generating capacity that the city of Long Island, especially if you want to uh, have more tree cover on a whole variety of things. Does this include commercial buildings at all? Because it seems like that is the the big flat place where we can stick a bajillion solar panels that have parking no lots. cover already. Mm -hmm. Parking lots, you know, all the big commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, so I guess I just have two questions really. Number one, does any of this include uh, commercial space, like significant commercial space? And number two, do we actually have an idea if everybody in town put solar panels on their house, what we would what we would max out at actually producing on, 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 on where that would go <laughs> for the actual needs of the city? Yeah, uh, yes, everything implied, everything I've talked to you about today is both residential and commercial. Interconnection standards, the way we we, we have net excess energy, because we have different categories of paying back commercial. Are there, are there large commercial spaces that are in, in contract with the city about putting solar? Not at the like moment. Like Target? Not really. Walmart. 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 Sprouts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the, the situation is that our electric rates are so low that their corporate standards don't require it. But if we, uh, as I've been pushing for it, uh, you know, could you, do you have time 10 minutes after the meeting? Because I don't want to hold this up, but I want to talk about it. We, we do have yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, I did put it on the yeah. agenda. Yeah. 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 We can yeah. have, you yeah. know, yeah. come yeah. back and I'd be happy to yeah. 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 I'll say I'm always keeping my eye open yeah. for big groups. I just don't have any plans for them at this moment. But it's definitely something that's on my radar. Yeah. Always looking for groups yeah. and grounds. Do we have an idea of how much the city could produce if all the residential yeah. systems? All I know is that, that we have to bet the forecast of 81 megawatts. I do not know if we maximize every space what that would look like. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, so it's not, it's not on the agenda, but the... 10, it's other business. Other business. Yeah. 10A. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just quickly, uh, we have several vacancies that are coming up, and so we do need to decide how we want to approach the recruitment um, and the process for um, interviewing applicants that come through. So I thought about this. Okay. Well let me just let everyone know what we did previously and so you all can decide if you want to review the same well, thing. We had to do it again because we have a small group left and we had a small group that didn't review so everyone who's left on the committee needs to review. Mary well, hold on a second on your comments okay. and let Lisa finish please. So last year the way that we did it we interviewed the or the op 
we, we had a small nominating committee that interviewed the applicants and then brought those recommendations to the board to essentially approve and then that's what we sent on to city council. Ultimately, city council has the decision making of who they appoint. The other option would be to interview as a full board and that would essentially be the May meeting, I assume, or we would have to schedule something outside of the May meeting that works for everybody. So those are the options that are on the table. You all need to decide if those are how you want to do it this year. Well, I vote that we do it as a whole board because the board at the size is so small it is a nominating committee. Last year we had two people as the nominating committee. Yeah, the nominating committee is um, two you're restricted to two members, so you don't have the yeah. meeting component to it. But there are three. But anyway. Um Kate, there was two. But yeah. So or the whole board would be anyone on the board who wants to be a part of that. So if you are applying now, and then if you make the applicants. So we would need to do interviews, I believe, between now and the May meeting. So I have to make it. Well, I would like to um, propose that we just do it as a board rather than doing two steps, since there's only four of us left. Sure, there would not be two steps. So the nominating committee would act on behalf of the board to make the recommendation to city council. They would not bring it to the board. Oh, okay. Sorry, I messed up on that. Yeah. Was it both of us? No. No. Mm -hmm. we did not. Oh. Yeah, I remember voting. Right. I remember voting. Yeah, we yeah. don't. I remember, I remember voting, voting on it. I think yeah. we. Don't. That's not the way it has worked. Cool. Yeah. Huh. I think last time you all did it as a board. The first time we did it as a nominating committee, and that committee forwarded their um, recommendation to council on behalf of the board. I, I, I remember all of us voted on this. Well, I was well, like last to year. That, so last year, the board did on. it together instead of having a nominating okay. committee. Right, that's what I'm saying. The first time we decided yeah. if we use the May meeting as, or do we need to figure out if we have a, a May a meeting and meeting. Do we don't have any interviews in the process? Can we do it? I don't have any idea how many applicants there are that have completed that. Well, it's still open, I think. The um, recruitment rate is still open. I still want to propose that we do it for the meeting and that the remaining board members are all present and can vote. That's my proposal, my motion. And I guess the three of us need it. Us two and twelve. There's really only four people here. So our name members are Michelle and Mary. Yeah. And, and Robert. Robert. Robert is up for renewal this year as well. Oh, because okay. Charles is leaving his um, his position early, so there's actually four vacancies. Okay. <clears throat> the fact that we're leaving does that mean we we don't? You would you if you're not reapplying, you would be able to be part of the decision for yeah. who's going. Should I do a motion? I did a motion. So and I'm asking for a second. second. Motion. My motion is that at the next meeting, the remaining board members uh, do the review process and make and uh, create the recommendations that will go to city council. That is my motion. The remaining members or the board? Or the board, sorry. Okay. Cool. So does that mean? That's right. Yeah. That means that we would do all the interviews at the next meeting or we would set up a separate meeting? Just depending on how many people. You could do out. it either after the meeting or ahead of the meeting if you wanted to do it that way. So you can cut into the meeting. I will amend my amend motions it. that we start a little bit early so that we can get it all done at that one time. That is my motion so that we start a little bit early and that the board, and I when I said remaining board, I meant because, yeah, it looks like Charles has, has excused himself for the rest of the sessions. No, so he's just he's, not available today. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I think he should be he's in May, out, right? He's okay. out in May because he's oh. going to be in Utah. Yeah. So he's already in May. Yeah, so, so I thought that, that he said stuff. that he was okay. not, that he was. Yeah. So anyway, my motion is that the board will review the applicant. We'll start a little early and review the applicants and create the recommendations to go to City Council at the next meeting. So the applicants, it would actually be interviews that you would interview talk with them. Yep, yeah. okay. with them. Okay. And you would divvy up how long the interview is based on how many yeah. people? Okay. Yep. So the meeting would start at what time? time did you decide? Uh, so we'll see, could we start at 3.30? Could have, could have. 
Well, well, computer, it's virtual. So to start at 3.30? Uh, how, how packed is the next meeting schedule? Do we know? Can you see the future? I, I can determine the future. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a couple of tentative things, the deep dive on passive design or discussion on regenerative agriculture and other things. I probably need to bump that piece anyway based on the conversation we had today. So there's space for me to move some of those things so, so if we did an interview starting at four, this would probably be a thousand people. That would only be a half hour before a regular meeting for starts. Four positions. I think it has to be three thirty. Well, and it's not exactly. four; it's however many applicants we have. Yeah, so four, for four positions. So four to fill four yeah. positions. Yeah. Yes. I think three thirty. Yeah. yeah, and just based on past experience, y'all should be out there recruiting because um, four is a lot of people. A lot of applicants. Yeah, I was say I don't have four applicants. Yeah. Oh my good lord. Okay, so. So the motion would be that next month we start our meeting at 3.30. Yeah. So we would interview applicants and then as a board vote yeah. on who to recommend to council. Yes. And your That's regular right. meeting would still start at 4.30. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I will second that. <laughs> Can we vote? Yes. All those. I'm not, I'm not, I don't I'm agree. Not, I'm just, just wait. Okay. All right. Are you vote? Are you okay? <laughs> okay. So, so I don't know if you're voting your strategy. Kate, I'm trying to Kate voted ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Good. So that's what we'll do. Yeah. All right. Marcia. And, sorry. Hold on a second. Marcia, did you have a question? I did have a question for you, Lisa. Okay. Uh, or or Francie or whoever is doing the equity. I can't remember the name of it. Equitable climate action. Yeah, that. Um, it'd be great if maybe. Uh, are there any members of that that could uh, uh, be on a board? Because these these sustainability boards are so wide. You know, it would be good. <laughs> that's the, are on the, same. the meetings are on the same night, actually. Yes, oh. um, that's probably a separate conversation, and I yeah. do. It is six thirty-three, so we can put it put okay. in that for another time because I there's a lot more to that that I think as a conversation we would need to have. And can we just do a quick vote? to continue the conversation about to say yes or no if we're interested in the passive design. Yes, yeah, so that was the other so the one last thing if you don't mind really quickly. We voted last time to do a deep dive on passive design and then realized we didn't have a quorum to vote. So okay, I'm just re bringing that to um, I do also want to just make note of the fact that at the city council meeting on April 9th the mayor did also Make motion, which was approved, to bring forward building electrification codes, and I'm not sure the timing of that. So some of that might be accelerated, and I'm waiting to hear from building services folks on what the timeline of that is. And I still want to make sure that 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 comes to you all for conversation. Um, so I know that we wanted to have the passive design conversation kind of before, hopefully, that other broader building electrification. Vote on the passive design. Okay, can so I can I said I was gonna do some research, put some big data for us to talk about. Maybe we can bring um, Michael, what's his last name? Back again. The architect that Lisa and I met with who's built uh, the passive neighborhood in it's a little passive okay. block um, in um, Prospect, and he's also just been put down a project in Argata, which has been highly sobering from a, uh, a zoning and land use uh, point of view. And has a lot to say about how cities should behave in this regard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is so I would like to make a motion that we have that deep dive as soon as possible. Um, it could be the next meeting. Um, you would find the people that you would like to invite to bring in. To yes. as experts on that, yeah. Um, so my motion is that we have that um, conversation. We do it at the next meeting. Discussion. The next meeting, or as soon as possible, or or as soon as possible after that, if it doesn't fit in the next meeting. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Sorry to keep you all past. Council, items from council. So we already got the electrification item. All right. So that's a big one. I had not mentioned that anything that you wanted to share. Um, not to keep you shared in maybe with five minutes, so I'll, I'll hold okay. my tongue for now. Um, and so, it's all adjourn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.